Okay, you are seeing only one now, right? Yes, we are okay. live. We are live. Okay. So, what... good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I welcome you to our first in the series of uh, Wealthy Mind, Healthy Body series at Ixosana. Our first topic uh, that we are taking today is aging with grace, and that will be taken by one, uh, one of our members at Ixosana, a distinguished mountaineer in the medical field, Dr. Dakwa Odumosu, uh, will be taking us through uh, the presentation on aging with grace. Thank you very much for joining us all around the world. We appreciate your presence here today. Go ahead, sir. We're ready for you. Yeah. Um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, because it's still morning in Arizona here. And uh, I want to thank the president of Ixosana, uh, Mrs. Ola Fumiloye, for uh, making this happen. And uh, uh, she is really like a, a servant leader in the way that she's been leading the association. And I really thank her for, for helping me with this because I'm not very computer savvy. I also want to thank Senior Jide Johnson for bringing up this topic. Uh, it was in January that he gave me a call and he said he wanted me to make a presentation on this topic. And I was surprised because uh, the last seven years of my practice, they were spent taking care of elderly people with average age in the uh, mid eighties. I actually had a patient who was 102 years old at one time. So I can say that I know a little bit about the topic of uh, uh, elderly care. Uh, I would start by saying that uh, human medicine is divided into like three categories, um, pediatrics from zero to like 17 or 18 years, and then adult medicine from 18 to 65 and geriatrics from 65 and above. Um, each one of these categories, they represent uh, special character, they have special features. So there are some things that you have to do for each one of them and some things that you don't have to do uh, as uh, each as you move from one group to the other. So this is for um, people who are above 65 years of age and I am one of them. So um, if I say anything, it's obviously not derogatory because I'm uh, part of the group. Um, you know, there's an event happening today, which is the eclipse of the moon, of solar eclipse. And if you look at the, uh, the, the presented the slide, the very first one is to define a day as the time it takes for the earth to go around the sun uh, one time. It actually travels at 67,000 miles per hour. Uh, I have, have not seen any policeman that's going to give a, a speeding ticket to the earth uh, because it's just, we, we don't even feel it anyway. And it, it also makes another movement, which is to revolve around its axis. And that takes place um, once every 24 hours. And that one goes around 1,000 miles per hour. So the earth actually travels maybe around 68,000 miles every hour. So the time it takes to complete one revolution is called a year, and the time it takes to spin round is called a day. And the relationship between a year and a day is 365.25. That's why we have leap years. Um, so our age is calculated based on the number of times that we have spent going around the sun one time. So, if you do that 65 times, then you qualify to be a member of this group. Um, on different planets, the, the world 
uh, sorry, the, the revolution around the sun uh, takes place at different times because they are, it depends on how close they are to the sun. Mercury, for example, is 88 days. Our own Earth is 365.25. And Neptune is 60,190 Earth days. So it means that all of us on Earth right now, if we are on Neptune, we will all be babies. Uh, we will not be walking. So uh, that's our uh, that's the interesting thing. And then you have the picture of the solar system with uh, these planets moving around. Now, there are some theories that have been uh, propagated about aging. Why do we age? Why, why do um, living things age? Uh, there's a branch of biology called epigenetics, which deals with the dif differentiation of individual cells uh, from the embryo. You know, what happens is when we were formed, when in the uterus, we were a tiny little cell. And then these cells, they keep dividing and dividing and dividing. And then at, at, at one stage, each of those cells can become any part of our being. But then it comes to a certain stage that they are no longer able to form uh, some structures. For example, the tissues that are designed to form the eye will form the eye. They can no longer form the brain or the limbs or the liver and so on and so forth. So it's, it's like when you go to like Dubai Market or Jankara, and you buy a piece of cloth, it's uh, like maybe five yards, and it can be cut into any pattern. So a stem cell is like that. It's like that piece of cloth that is yet to be cut into different shapes and patterns. So a stem cell can form any, any cell in the body. Uh, it is capable of differentiating that is to change from that stem cell into other cells. And we can get stem cells from cord blood, umbilical cord, or from the bone marrow, or from dental tissue, from the teeth. Um, but it's easier to get from the cord blood. So um, the studies about epigenetics, they uh, deal mainly with cord blood studies. Um, the reason why we are talking about this is because uh, there are studies going on about aging. So that goes to the next slide, yes. Um, David Sinclair, he wrote in a journal this year in January that what causes aging is usually uh, the, the loss of information in the cells. The, uh, sorry, I'm trying. To, I will try to be as simple as possible um, because I know that some people don't uh, know too much of biology. But we are, when we talk about cells, these are the building blocks of the the human body. It's like you are constructing a building and you use cement blocks, one on top of the other. And so the cells are like that. The only thing is that there are different types of cells, uh, depending on the type, the part of the body that you're talking about. So he thinks that the, the, there's lots of information in the cells and also accumulation of damage caused by uh, various metabolic processes going on in the cells. Um, without being too um, theoretical, I will just mention that another person mentioned that there are four genes that he had been able to isolate that can help to turn back the clock in adult cells to their embryonic stem cell stage. Remember this stem cell that we just mentioned. And so uh, it's like you are rebooting a computer. So when these studies are going on now, we don't know what's going to happen in the next maybe 20 years from now. Uh, it's possible that 
they can start to regenerate parts of the human body. And so people will be able to live longer. Now to the next cell, uh, sorry, next uh, slide. Uh, the theories about aging, this one deals with uh, the, the way we live and the way it can affect our ability to live to a long life. Um, the first one is activity theory. That is, you uh, keep on doing those activities that you are used to, uh, like volunteering, even after you retire. Uh, then the next one is continuity theory. Uh, that is, the, your habits, your preferences, uh, your lifestyles and relationships, uh, you need to maintain them as long as possible. And then there's disengagement theory. It involves a gradual but inevitable uh, withdrawal from interactions between the individual and the rest of the society. This one is particularly relevant to when we retire from like our careers. So um, that is you retire from your careers, but you also uh, start doing something. Uh, like pick up something like photography, uh, gardening, um, music, playing the piano, and so on. And then there is the DNA damage theory, which uh, again, DNA in our cells they get damaged, and they are constant. The body tries to repair them constantly, but when the repair is not very effective, the body sends signals to destroy these cells, the cells that are not doing well. We call that apo apoptosis. Uh, the cells just die off, okay? Uh, and then I should mention that the cells in the body that I talked about, each cell lives for a certain number of period, a certain number of days, sometimes months, and then they die. For example, red blood cells in the body, they live for 120 days, and then they are constantly replaced from the bone marrow. Platelets, also a component of blood, they last just about seven days. White blood cells, about 13 to 20 days. Brain cells, they do not get replaced. So when they are damaged, that's all. That's all. They, it's the end of the part of the brain where that cell is damaged. So that's why uh, when uh, people suffer stroke, it's very difficult to come back in many cases. Um, the next slide deals with what we call agiotypes. Um, you know, when you buy a car, no matter what type of car it is, whether Lamborghini or Ferrari or just your regular Chevrolet, it's brand new at one time. And then different parts of the car, they start to depreciate at different times. So, um, so aging is something that differs from one person to the other and also from one part of the body to the other. But there are some four clear types that have been identified. Metabolic, these are people who suffer from metabolic diseases like diabetes more than any other disease. They tend to be overweight and, uh, and so on and so forth. Then the next one is the immune uh, type where they are more likely to be uh, suffering from immunocompromise, uh, they have more of infections and, and so on. The next one is nephrotic, which means that they have more of kidney type of diseases than other uh, disease types. And the last one is hepatic, that is liver uh, dominant uh, disease pattern. There are other forms that have been uh, identified like cardiovascular and maybe neurologic but studies are going on about all these types of uh, agiotypes. The next slide is um, stem cells. Okay, uh, 
this the, this shows us uh, the various uh, cell types in the body. This is not everything. You have the sex cells, the muscle cells, the fat cells, immune cells, stem uh, sorry, bone cells, epithelial cells, nerve cells, and blood cells. They are all derived from that uh, stem cell that I talked about just now. Uh, when initially stem cell, and then it can form any of this. It's like, again, like that piece of clothing that you bought and you have not done anything about it. And then eventually you can cut it into different patterns. But once you cut it, it can no longer do the job. For example, if you cut it into the shape of a blouse, it can no longer be uh, used as a pant, right? So. That's the uh, type of thing that we're talking about. Okay, next slide. Um, different parts of the body, like I said, they age in different ways. Um, for example, the joints, uh, they, 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 they start aging uh, due to wear and tear. Uh, there is cartilage, a joint, a joint is where two bones meet. Any, any place where, two bones meet, that's a joint. And in between those two bones, we have what we call cartilage. And the cartilage eventually starts wearing off. Uh, it's eventually due to old age, they start wearing off and then the bone could start rubbing against bone. And that's what causes the pain of arthritis. The, the bones that are, the joints that are mainly affected are the joints of the shoulder, the elbow, the hips, and the knees. This is part of normal aging because we, we call it normal because it's going to happen uh, inevitably. It happens in almost everybody. Um, then the skin, it loses collagen and also the natural oils. So it causes wrinkling. And this is characteristic of old age. Uh, it helps you to know who is old than uh, who is young. But nowadays they use things like Botox uh, to eliminate some of the uh, creases and wrinkles. The parts of the body that are exposed to ultraviolet rays, like the face, the arms, are more likely to be wrinkled than those parts that are not exposed to UV, UV light. And also depending on the, uh, the, the way the person, uh, the mannerisms, uh, smiling, frowning, squinting, uh, they, can have, they can lead to uh, the presence of some wrinkles, especially around the, the angles of the eyes. Um, well, we see somebody with facial wrinkles uh, uh, there. And then part of normal aging, the air starts to turn gray. Uh, this is because of loss of melanin, the pigment that, uh, uh, that accounts for the color, coloring of the air. And in some families like mine, uh, graying of the air starts in our late twenties. In some people, it's delayed, but eventually your hair will, will turn gray. Um, then sub, subcutaneous tissue, that's the tissue that is immediately under the skin. Again, it loses, um, uh, there's loss of fat, and there are also fat deposits in the middle part of the body, but under the skin, fat is lost. So that contributes to wrinkling also. And then uh, the connective tissue, that's muscle uh, and uh, bone. You start losing bone mass and also muscle mass. And uh, this is called sarcopenia. And it affects people of all races. And uh, also one characteristic of aging is the, uh, the person likely loses height. If you are six feet tall at one time, you probably will be like maybe five feet 11 uh, because the vertebrae, the, the spine, uh, the, the, the gap between the vertebrae, they start 
losing, uh, um, there, there's a loss of intervertebral disc, and that contributes to this loss of height. You will see that most elderly people, they are shorter, um, they, they, they appear to be shorter than their uh, uh, previous ages. And osteoporosis and osteopenia, they also happen. Uh, I will say that osteoporosis is the older sister of osteopenia. Uh, jokes, uh, this, this, this is just a joke anyway, but it's, both of them are virtually similar, but osteoporosis is more severe than osteopenia. They both denote brain, uh, sorry, bone loss. Um, what the, the, there's a study that is called DEXA scan, dual X-ray, uh, dual energy X-ray ab absorptiometry, DEXA. This is used to uh, denote or to quantify uh, the amount of bone loss in uh, people. Uh, this problem is more common in thin Caucasian women. That is, you are female, you are Caucasian, you are more likely to have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Uh, blacks are likely to have, but not as much as Caucasians. This is one of the very, very few instances where being obese is helpful. Uh, that is, when you are obese, you are less likely to have osteoporosis. I'm not saying that people should start thinking of being obese. Anyway, uh, now let's talk about the brain. The small vessels, small blood vessels in the uh, white matter. The white matter is the inner part of the brain. The outer part is the gray matter, which is on the surface. And the white matter is the one that connects the nerve tissues. So the blood vessels undergo what we call ischemia. Ischemia is just a medical term for decreased blood vessel supply. And so this causes shrinking of the brain, which is a gradual process. And eventually it could uh, cause stroke and possibly dementia. The eyes, uh, as we old, as we get older, the ability to focus becomes difficult. We call it presby presbyopia. It usually starts from around the age of 40. And uh, this is because the lens becomes uh, sluggish. Uh, and uh, this is around the time that you uh, need to see your ophthalmologist maybe start wearing glasses. It's usually very easy to correct. The ears, presbycusia, which is symmetrical, progressive hearing loss due to aging. Uh, this can be worsened by previous exposure to loud noise, but whether or not the person is exposed to noise, uh, presbycusia will occur at one time or the other. And so in elderly people, you have to talk louder. You have to sometimes have to uh, shout uh, because they have reduced hearing ability due to the loss of hair cells in the, in the, in the inner ear. Then the immune system, the next slide. The immune system, uh, there is reduced ability to fight off infections and also uh, the response. Normally when we have infections, our body triggers a response by raising the body temperature, uh, which is what we call febrile response. The ability to develop this response is diminished. And there is also a group of diseases called autoimmune disorders. These are more common as we go, grow older. Uh, in autoimmune disorders, the body starts to attack its own self. Normally, you know that this is part of your body, so you don't do anything about it. But when autoimmune disorders uh, occur, the body's ability to recognize 
uh, self is diminished and um, some forms of diabetes and thyroid disorders are common, uh, commonly due to autoimmune disorders. Um, also, the ability to respond to vaccines also declines and uh, the ability of the body to re repair uh, damaged cells also is diminished. And this has been uh, said to be one of the possible causes of cancer. Okay, next slide. The genitourinary system. In women, of course, we all know that the women start to, uh, they go into menopause. Uh, this usually occurs around about 51 uh, to 55 years of age. It sometimes occurs earlier, uh, premature menopause, and sometimes it delays. Some women, they don't reach menopause until the age of 60 plus, but overall, it's usually about 51, 52 to 55. Um, this is due to loss of hormones. The hormone levels fall and the, the vaginal uh, mucosa becomes dry and coitus or sexual intercourse becomes difficult or painful. In men, the major problem is the prostate. It becomes enlarged. The prostate is a walnut-sized organ uh, located just below the uh, bladder the urinary bladder. And when it starts to become enlarged, because the urethra, the tube that lets urine uh, out of the body, it passes through this prostate gland. So the prostate squeezes on the urethra and then it becomes very difficult to pee. And so the characteristics of this problem will be number one, hesitancy. The, he wants to pee, he gets there, he, he cannot pee. Uh, number two, he feels urgency, hesitancy, urgency. Urgency means you feel like going, you feel like running to the bathroom. And when you get there, hesitancy of course. You stand there, the urine doesn't come out. Uh, and then uh, frequency, that is you go many, many times. You may have to wake up two or three or four times at night. So it causes sleep disturbance, which is another problem on its own. Uh, normally, when you empty your bladder, you should not have more than about 50 to 200 mils of urine there. So one way to know whether this problem is there is to do a bladder scan uh, or to catheterize, to uh, pass a catheter into the bladder. You should not have more than 50 to 200 mils after the person has just voided. Women, interestingly, can also have this problem, even though they don't have prostate, because what happens is their structures, the uterus and the vagin vagina, they are held in place by ligaments. And uh, these ligaments are attached to the sides of the body. Due to aging, due to having been pregnant many times, these ligaments can become weak and then they fall down. Uh, they, they cause the uterus and the vagina and the cervix to sag, and that can pull on the neck of the urethra, and they also will have problem passing urine. The difference between the male and the female types is that in, in women, uh, it occurs usually suddenly, and uh, so the problem is usually repaired surgically, or sometimes they use pastries to return this structures back to their normal places. Um, the slide, ne next one is that of uh, uh, the benign prostatic hypertrophy. I should state at this point that we have to differentiate between this problem that I just mentioned uh, regarding the prostate and a major, major problem called prostate cancer because they present in the same way uh, but usually in some in prostate cancer, one the, the person might see uh, blood in the urine, but it doesn't have to happen. You may have no blood. So when a man starts seeing those symptoms, he, he needs to go to see his urologist so that they can differentiate between uh, BPH, which is benign prostatic hypertrophy, and prostate cancer. Okay, now. 
Abnormal aging, next slide. Abnormal aging is something that doesn't have, have to happen, but they, are, they commonly occur. Uh, for bones, we, we have fractures, uh, which are aggravated by falls. So we have to take four precautions. Um, and the four precautions in uh, elderly, I believe we will still talk about them. Uh, uh, don't climb ladders. Don't, uh, okay, avoid climbing ladders, no throw logs, no guarding horses, uh, no little animals that can make them trip. And then uh, part of abnormal aging, uh, systemic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and um, thyroid disorders, uh, some forms of cancer. The most common are lungs, colon, ovarian, brain, uterine, bone, and blood cancers. And then diseases of the valve, of the blood vessels, and also the valves, like the aortic stenosis and aortic dissection. And these are, the aorta is the major blood vessel in the body. And uh, when it becomes either too much enlarged or very thin, it can rupture. If it ruptures, it's instant death. Um, then the reproductive system. Uh, in men, erectile dysfunction, uh, they cannot get the gentleman to wake up. And uh, uh, this correlates very well with uh, other cardiovascular disorders because what causes penile erection is due to congestion of the, of the blood vessels in the penis. So if the blood vessels are diseased, this can lead to erectile dysfunction. And when you have disease of blood vessels in one part of the body, it can also be a sign of disease of blood vessels in other parts. So that's why there's a correlation between both of them. Then you have gastrointestinal disorders like reduced appetite. And also very important is the thirst mechanism. Normally when we feel thirsty, something tells us in our brain that we need to go and drink water. But in elderly people, this mechanism is a little bit disturbed. So they may not be drinking as much water as they need to drink. And then they have the tendency to, to become dehydrated. Also, you have uh, changes in taste and the swallowing mechanism can also be affected. There's a possibility of reflux. Is, um, ingested material from the stomach coming out uh, into the esophagus, and that can cause erosion of the, uh, the lower part of the esophagus, and that can cause uh, uh, so a form of ulcer. And also you have uh, either alternation of constipation or, or diarrhea, and sometimes fecal incontinence. Due to relaxation of the sphincter that allows waste matter to flow out of the body. And then neuropsychological disorders, the most prominent uh, ones are Alzheimer's disorder, or Alzheimer's dementia, and uh, uh, delirium and depression. Uh, the major difference between delirium and uh, dementia is that delirium is temporary. It occurs usually due to an abnormal metabolic process in the body, and then it clears when you remove the cause. Uh, interestingly, the most common pain, uh, uh, cause of uh, delirium in elderly people is urinary tract infection. So once you treat the UTI or urinary, urinary tract infection, the delirium usually clears completely. And depression, of course, this affects very young, the very old, or anybody. Uh, when you go to your primary care physician, they ask uh, questions like, have you been feeling down? Have you been thinking about, uh, uh, are, you, are you happy with your life? 
and so on. So they have a two question screening. And then if you answer yes to them, then they go on to the complete screening, which can tell them whether uh, the person needs to be referred to a psychiatrist or not, or whether um, to start uh, the, the treatment with um, an anti-depressive uh, uh, illness, uh, medication, sorry. Um, Next slide. There are drugs and aging. Uh, um, in 1991, a uh, physician called uh, Bias, uh, this is not uh, Hennekin or uh, Golda, the name of the gentleman was Bias, B E E R S. He and a group of people designed uh, a, 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 a group of uh, criteria that should be met before medications are given to adults. So we have, um, there are some that should not be given once you are above 65. There are some that should be given with caution due to some conditions that the person may have. There are some that may not be given due to what we call drug-drug interaction. That is because you are taking a particular drug, you may not be allowed to take another drug. There are some that may be given, but with reduced dosages. So instead of, let's say, giving 10 milligrams, you may have to give like five milligrams because of the current uh, condition that this patient is having. So, we categorize into A, C, and H. Avoid, caution, high risk. Okay, avoid completely, don't give at all. Caution, be careful. Uh, think about other things and high risk. Well, you know that this patient is at high risk, but you may still want to give this medication in spite of everything because the patient will benefit more. And the other thing is if the um, side effect profile is too much uh, for the patient. Uh, that is, the patient will lose more than the, he or she will benefit from taking the medication. So the, the, the result is do not give that type of medication. Of course, uh, when you go to your physician, it's the duty of the physician to think about this. But the pharmacist also plays a large role in this. And nowadays, the uh, computers are so designed that as soon as you punch in a medication for a particular patient, the age is recognized, and then all the medical conditions the patient has. So the computer immediately flags some of these medications and tells you this patient should not be on this medication. But the physician can still override the computer and say, yes, I know, but I believe that this patient needs this medication. So let's give a few examples. Analgesics, these are pain medications, um, antihistamines, um, antipsychotics, anxiolytics, anticholinergics, hypnotics, and some antibiotics. Um, Elderly patients are they also like they're likely to be on many medications. In fact, the remember the 65 year old uh, criteria. 90 percent of people who are 65 and above are on at least one medication. 67 percent of this same group are on multiple medications. There is something we call polypharmacy. You have patients on like 12. 13, 14, 16 medications. And when you start getting into that range, you are going to have what we call drug-drug interaction. So one has to be very careful. So you use as few medications as possible. And also we have to remember that the kidneys and the liver are the two organs that handle medications when we put them in the body. And as you grow older, the ability of the kidneys and the liver to metabolize medications 
decreases. So some of the medications, they stay longer than necessary and they could cause toxicity. So that's one thing to be very aware of. Another very important thing is that when, as we grow old, uh, I'm, I'm a victim of this, uh, you, you sometimes forget that you have not taken your medication or sometimes you forget that you have taken the medication. So if you, have, if, if you don't take the medication because you forgot to take them, then you will have low bioavailability. That is the, the level of the medication in the body will be very low and the effect will diminish and um, uh, the, 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 it, it will not do what it's supposed to do. And the other way around, if you, if you take, when you, you, maybe you forgot that you've taken the medication and you take an extra, of course, you are likely to have toxic levels developing. So to correct this, uh, pharmacists, uh, sorry, pharmacies, they sell pill boxes where they arrange the uh, pills Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and also according to time of the day. But still, somebody has to prime the elderly people to be able to know whether they've taken their medications or not. I mentioned that uh, uh, elderly people may not show the febrile reaction to infections, so their body temperature may not rise appropriately. Okay. Um, urinary tract infection is very, very common. And it's a common cause of what we call altered, altered mental status um, in elderly people. And as soon as you treat the uh, urinary tract infection or dehydration, uh, the condition usually clears completely. Okay, and the thirst mechanism is low, is poor. Uh, okay. Um, Then let's talk about situational adjustments for the aged. Um, where elderly people live, usually the, the, the poor, the, remember I talked about poor eyesight, the eyesight is already poor. So you give them increased lighting, but the lights must not be the one that will give them glare. Okay, the walls, are usually not made up of gloss paint that can re reflect. Okay, the, there must be no throw rugs, that is like passion rugs that are on the floor. Every, all the rugs must be attached to the floor to avoid tripping them. And the lightning in the light should, in the room should be even. So it's not that one part of the room is dark and the other one is light because that can cause uh, disturbance uh, or disequilibrium, and then can lead to force. Um, this, the light switches should be where they are. Uh, is they are easy to access for the person, and then um, staircases should be well lit and uh, well indicated, and bedrooms and doorways. And uh, talking about staircases, as much as possible. Elderly people should not go upstairs if it's possible, if it's possible. And if it's inevitable, then they should use a stair lift. Uh, stair lifts are very commonly uh, available now. Uh, even in Nigeria now, I know there are uh, places that, that have stair lifts. So because our culture dictates that we have to live upstairs. Uh, so that's uh, something that it will take some time before it's corrected. Okay. Um, now next slide shows age-specific screening tests. Um, colonoscopy from the age of 45 and should be repeated every 10 years. Uh, nowadays, cancer of the colon is becoming very common and it's occurring at younger ages. So if some, a member of your family 
like a first degree relative when first degree will mean parents or siblings. If any first degree relative has cancer of the colon, you have to screen 10 years at, I mean, if the person developed cancer at let's say uh, 50, you have to start your own screening at the age of 40. You don't have to wait until 45. So, and it has to be repeated every 10 years, but if there are abnormal findings, then the uh, repetition could be like every five years instead of 10 years. Uh, instead of colonoscopy, there's something we call the fecal immuno uh, uh, chemical test, FIT, uh, which can also be used for screening for colon cancer. Mammogram for women from 50 to 74 years uh, and every two years after. Between the age of 40 and 49 years, if there is history of cancer of the breast in that family, you have to start screening earlier. Prostate cancer, this is big problem amongst black males. It is very, very common amongst blacks. So do your prostate cancer screening with PSA. Recently, it was even uh, uh, said that the PSA has not been very sensitive. That is, sometimes PSA is normal, but there's still prostate cancer. So they now they are introducing MRI scan, which is more sensitive, can pick up more prostate cancer uh, results. Okay, cervical cancer screening with uh, uh, pap smear, that's been going on for a long time. And now they've introduced the, uh, the HPV test, which uh, is used for women 25 to 65 years of age. And then, uh, and then lung cancer screening has now been approved for those who smoke heavily. And um, this will be uh, used with low dose CT scan. Um, and then the next one is routine annual examinations. We need to visit our primary care physician at least once a year, if needed more than that. For women, OBGYN examination also once a year at least. Then you have an annual eye examination at least once a year. And then uh, audiology screening at least once. And then if it's found to be normal, you may not have to repeat it. Dental examinations as needed. Um, in the olden days, one of the characteristics of uh, old age is uh, uh, being toothless. That's because the, the teeth have all uh, fallen out because of the resorption of the bones of the jaw. But with good dental care, this can be prevented. Um, and now to the next slide, which is the second to the last one. Um, there are five stages of aging, five that we go through. Uh, from the age of 65 or around that for each individual. The first step is self-sufficiency. At this stage, you are able to do everything by yourself. When I say everything, I'm talking of activities of daily living. These activities include bathing, grooming, toileting, continence, eating, and mobility. If you can do all this by yourself, yes, you are free to stay alone. You can live alone anywhere. You should be able to bathe yourself. If the person cannot uh, wash the back, uh, some, this, this is still regarding, regarded as, yes, the, the patient can bathe by himself or herself, but somebody may have to assist in washing the back. Dressing, yes. You should also be able to put up your dresses. You should be able to uh, uh, groom yourself. You should be able to eat by yourself. You should be able to do your toileting by yourself. Uh, and uh, you should be, if, you are, if, if you are not continent, that is, the, there is leakage of urine and, and, and feces. But if you can take care of this by yourself, you can still live alone. Now, uh, the next stage after that is interdependence. Interdependence means you are able to do 
the ADLs, activities of daily living, but some of the, like the in, uh, instrumental activities of daily living, like driving, shopping, uh, doing your finances, uh, um, using the computer, uh, you may not be able to do some of this anymore. Okay, so you need assistance with this. At this point, you can still live alone, but with somebody coming from outside to help you, okay? And then it gets to the next one, which is the stage of dependence. When we get to this stage, you are no longer able to do the activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. You depend on other people. At this stage of dependence, you cannot live alone. Um, the next one after that is crisis management when the person develops severe illness that necessitates uh, being taken to the emergency room and admission to the hospital. Sometimes patients can go over, can get over this stage of crisis management, but sometimes it leads to the final point, which is the end of life. That's stage five. Now, let me quickly go back to the, uh, the type of the, the time of self-sufficiency. That is stage one. When we are at that stage, that is when we have to do things like write our wills, um, do uh, our estates, uh, establish whether we are, do not resuscitate or do not intubate status so that our caregivers will know what to do. We should also have a, uh, uh, a power of attorney, a medical power of attorney given to a close family member that you trust that will take care of you. Uh, so this should be done at this time of self-sufficiency or latest at the interdependent stage. And it is important to note that for each person, the time you move the time that you move from one stage to the other varies. And sometimes you don't know when you fall from one to the other stage. So it's always good to be well prepared for the eventualities. And then the next one is a favorite of mine. Uh, I say life as a bell curve. Okay, people always say, some people sometimes say life is a cycle. It's not, I don't think it's a cycle. It's like a bell curve. If you look at the beginning part of this, uh, that's when you are a child, a baby, you are not able to do anything. And then on the other side of it, you become very old. If you live long enough, maybe you are 120 years old, you are weak again, and somebody has to take care of you. In the middle part of it, that's when you have all the power in this world. You are able to do everything. From the beginning up to the top of the curve, you are rising, you are growing up. Everything is fine. But from the top of the curve to the end, start, you start to decline. And geriatric patients are on the, on the right side of this curve. Things are on the downward side. But it's good to look back to what you have gone through in life to enjoy and reminisce and uh, hope that the rest of your life will be, uh, if not uh, long, but at least will be lived to, to the fullest extent possible. Uh, when I gave this talk in September in New Jersey, uh, the Venerable Tike Jayoba, who was the uh, minister that was present, also an old boy of Iban Grammar School, he advised that I should include that this plan about growing old um, should also include the plan for our eternity, because the number of years we spend in this world, maybe 100, is nothing compared to the number of years that we'll spend in eternity. So we should also think about the spiritual part of this uh, 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 preparation. And uh, that brings me to the end of this talk.
uh, if there is any uh, discussion or any questions, I'm ready if I know the answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Odumosu. That was really very insightful. And um, well, I got a lot from it. Is that some things I didn't know before? We're going to uh, now open the floor for questions. And I think Dr. Okuoga is ready to ask a question. He already unmuted himself. <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dumosu. I must thank you for the very informative and um, highly illuminating presentation. Uh, yes. I really have this and I've uh, learned a lot from it. I extend warm greetings from Lagos. Mm -hmm. and I'm, thank my, you. Question, <laughs> my question here is, um, I do hear about lifespan and health span mm -hmm. that we should try as much as possible to extend our health span to line up with our lifespan. Mm -hmm. Are you able to shed light on some of those things that will help this? So one thing I've always had is um, being active, doing this. So maybe there are other things that you will like to shed light on and how we can line up our health span with our lifespan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I think it, it's very common now that we are exposed, especially in this age of social media. The, the three, in my opinion, my experience are diet, exercise, and sleep. You know, good sleep, we all need like at least seven hours of sleep every day. Uh, people have been able to associate longevity with having a good sleep. Um, the diet we eat, um, the diet should be such that is healthy to the body, is uh, nutritious, of course, and it's not... Uh, Okay, not injurious. Uh, of course, we are talking about refraining from red meat, for example. It's been touted as being one of the things that we need to stay away from. Uh, too much uh, high cholesterol uh, in the food, in the meals. Um, and also uh, the, the type of, not only the type of food and also when you eat. People of our age group, uh, Dr. Okuoga, I believe that you must be a geriatric person also, right? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, many of many members of our age group. Well, uh, very young we, at that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, we, we hardly eat three times a day anymore. So th there is ad people are advocating that we do uh, fasting, 16, 8. That means... For 16 hours in a day, you don't eat at all, and you eat mm -hmm. within like eight hour period, and you try to eat around that time. It's been touted to be helpful in keeping one's body weight. And of course, um, health exercise, uh, at least in a week, 30 minutes of exercise for at least three times a day, uh, sorry, three times a week, three times a week, minimum of 30 minutes. That means a minimum of 90 minutes of exercise. And that can include walking, just walking briskly, not like in uh, Rinikusobenle, but just walking briskly for like uh, at least one hour a day. Okay. I used to do eight miles every day, but I've reduced it now to five miles and maybe even three miles because I have a problem with my foot. So, um, so exercise, sleep, diet. I think those are the three key things. And of course, uh, going to see your doctor regularly. Uh, this question of, oh, uh, it's not my portion. I think we have to start, we, we have to stop thinking like that. Oh, God will not make it my portion. No, 
God does not do that to people. You have to, you know, St. Luke's, a, a disciple of Jesus Christ was a physician. So if God didn't want us to visit doctors, he will not, he will not have uh, uh, taken St. Luke to be one of his disciples, right? So I think those are, those are my own uh, uh, thoughts about in, in making sure that I think what you're trying to say is like, if you're destined to live 100 years, okay, make sure that you live your life to be 100 years. Of course, before I forget, smoking and alcohol, okay? Smoking and alcohol, obviously smoking zero, zero, complete zero. Alcohol, it's been said that a minimum intake of red wine is helpful for the heart. It's, you know, I don't really know whether I would say this is true or not, but sometimes we have to be careful because some of these uh, pieces of advice are propagated by the industry. People making wine can start saying, oh, red wine is good and so on. But I think there is some evidence that a minimum intake of red wine every day is helpful for the heart, but obviously not too much. Yeah. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Yes, thank you very much. I don't want yes. to monopolize the, this forum. The other question I have, if it's okay, yes. it's about the question of uh, gene. Some people will say, um, uh, I, there's one minister, uh, they said they were trying to threaten his life. He said, well, that he has it in his family gene that they don't live beyond 55. So, and he was already 60. So he said that even if they threaten him and kill him now, um, <laughs> that was no problem. So question about how the gene comes in into our health situation. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. That, that's a very good question. Um, you know, the, the person that you are referring to said that they don't usually live beyond 55. Are we sure? that this person, they don't have history of cancer somewhere in the body, colon, prostate, and so on. Let me give you an example. There is this very popular American actress, Angelina Jolie, okay? You know what she did? She went to have both breasts removed. She didn't have a diagnosis of cancer, but she told them to remove both breasts and they did. And you know the reason? Every female member of a family have history of breast cancer. Everyone. Because there's a gene called the BRCA gene, B-R-C-A. It's present in our family members. So genes, all, certainly they play a role in, in longevity. For example, being Blacks, you and I, we have increased risk of having prostate cancer compared to other demo demographic groups. The same thing in some families, some diseases run in families and some of these diseases are deadly, cancer, for example. So that person that you're talk talking about, it's possible. My thinking is that in that family, maybe there's something that runs in that family, which a thorough screening, like a colonoscopy, like checking your PSA, maybe it will find out, oh, this is what's been killing them. We, nobody knows. So that's the way I think it. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Any other question? Please, if you would like to ask a question, you can please uh, use uh, the emojis to raise your hand. Thank you. Um, oh, my name ahead. is Sukuoka. Um, I want to just ask a question on the uh, osteoporosis. You yes. talked about, yeah. Um, is, it is it possible to replace the cartilage between uh, the bones? You know, well, when uh the bones get, when you start to get this pain like uh from arthritis and all that can it be replaced because it's the um at the, the cartilage that is being 
uh, wearing out. Wearing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is it repeatable, the cartilage? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, remember I said the major joints that are affected are the, uh, the knees, the hips, the shoulder, and the elbows. There are doctors who specialize in replacement of these joints. Knee replacement is now very, very common. Some doctors can virtually close their eyes and do these surgeries because they do so many of them in a week. Yes. So the answer is yes. Knee replacement, hip replacement, shoulder replacement, elbow replacement. They are very, very commonly done. And before I, before I go on, uh, there's something I need to mention. You remember I talked about wear and tear, right? Uh, okay. It, it's more common with aging. But sometimes we see very young people with arthritis of especially the, the ankles, the ankles and the, and the knees. And you know what their profession is? They're athletes. They're athletes, especially gymnasts, because they subject these joints to tremendous stress. So they wear quickly, more, quick, more quicker than when uh, the person is not an athlete. But the answer to your question is yes, they can answer, uh, they, can replace, they can replace those joints easily. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're so welcome. We have yeah. Kabilo Ali, please. Yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, uh, please, I'm a finance person. Could you, is, could you put a cost of the cost of aging and how do you think people, based on your experience, we need to start planning for it? Because I know it's not cheap. Going to nursing home, getting an assisted living, getting somebody to come and live with you. Yeah, your own experience is that, can you put a cost? What is, what's your own? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, now, we're talking about the United States. Yeah? And uh, I would say, let's say comparing to Nigeria, uh, if you have a good retirement plan, you are able to, once you start getting to that dependence uh, stage and you find that you cannot live alone, so you either have to go to what we call a group home or an assisted living home. Uh, okay. And those homes, those places, sometimes if you have insurance coverage, like uh, there's one the insurance, the long-term care, LTC, I think that will cover the, the cost of stay in those places. If not, it has to be out of pocket. And in the United States, before you can qualify for, for aid, for assistance from the government, you must have finished everything that you have. All your money must have been uh, exhausted. So what people sometimes do is that they transfer their money to family members. Uh, this could look like trying to beat the system because before they... Uh, before the state takes over, they investigate, they make sure that you have nothing, nothing in your uh, possession anymore. And that's when you can become a ward of the state. But if you have to take care of yourself and employ uh, a caregiver, you know, in the US, you have to pay by the hour, uh, something, uh, some dollars per hour. I don't know exactly how much, but it's probably going to be nothing like nothing less than $15 to $20 every hour. Um, so that's the little I know about the financial aspect of care, but the, there's nothing better than, nothing as good as planning ahead, putting everything into consideration before you retire uh, or before you become incapacitated. I hope I've been able to answer your, your questions. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I just want to call attention to people that is a five-year look-back period if you are transferring things. So people need to take note in there. And there's, I think yeah, the amount you have to have is $2,000. So, Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So uh, I hope everybody takes that into consideration. All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ali, is it still on? Mr. Yemi Adigun. 
you had a question? Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for that presentation. Well, no good, well knowledgeable. I appreciate what you've done. Now, my question is this you talk about stem cells. Yeah. Okay. Is that, do, can we have it now in the US? Let's say I have my knee, as you said, or you have your foot problem or knee problem. Can we get a stem cell? Uh, operation or not? Is it available now or is it still in the process for future? I do not think stem cells are applicable for knee problems, but they are applicable especially for things like uh, Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's disease. They are beginning to use stem cells to help patients who have these problems. And also things like bone marrow cancer, like some leukemias. Yes, they have stem cell transplant being able to help them. But if it's knee replacement, if it's, oh, sorry, if it's a knee problem, it will be knee replacement. It will not be stem cell. Right. But stem cells are already being used for some medical processes. Oh, okay, great. Uh, thanks yes. for letting me know. You are welcome. All right. Any other question. I have a comment to myself, but I like um, okay. opportunity for our members to ask all of their questions first. All right. So my own is a, a trend that I've noticed recently. Uh, and I know that you said something which was very interesting, quite interesting to me. Uh, about uh, when uh, women are obese, sometimes they don't have the um, issue with osteoporosis. At the same time, we're not asking that people should be obese. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the trend that I've noticed, uh, when the elderly, when they try to get on all of this diet and they lose weight, uh, I, I have seen some of them, they become so fragile. And one of the things that I've been advising is that as an elderly person or even as a middle-aged person, do we really need to lose weight to the extent that we are so fragile and it looks as if we're going to break? Um, I'm advising people to, to not lose so much weight, especially when you are elderly. I don't know if it's a good advice that I should give to people. Mm. It's a delicate balance between the weight loss and uh, being health, staying healthy. Yeah. yeah, you are right. When you are really obese, there's more pressure on, especially the knees. So arthritis of the knees is more common. Okay. Um, but as you lose weight, this pressure on the knees becomes less. But like you said, what happens, the reason why being overweight is helpful in osteoporosis is because estrogen is a little bit higher in uh, people who have more weight. And so the, this is helpful. It ha it's helpful in uh, reducing the risk of osteoporosis. But when you lose weight, you become normal weight. Like I said, thin women are more likely to be osteoporotic than obese women. And uh, women are more likely to be osteoporotic than men. So it's a very delicate balance. So the answer to your question is, I don't know. It's difficult to say. At one time, it's healthy. And then at the other end, it's not very healthy. Because what you gain on one hand, you lose on the other hand. It's, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, for me, to say somebody is obese is really relative. And uh, some of the things that they term as obesity here is just, uh, is just, it's not that you are so fat, but the moment that you are not in a particular uh, kind of shape or narrative that they have, they categorize you as being obese. Whereas in Nigeria, for example, somebody like me is categorized as being obese. Year, no, but no, no, but, yeah, no, no. I mean, yes, my doctor will tell me that I'm obese, but no. I, I think it's probably a healthy 
like you said, weight to carry, as long as you are not so fat that you can even move yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, can I say something, please? Uh, there is a statistical way of going about it. Your weight divided by the square of your height gives you the body mass index, BMI, okay? Zero to 18 is, is starvation. You are, you are malnourished, okay? If your BMI is from zero to 18, of course, there is no body with zero, okay? But if it's 17 point something, you are malnourished. Between 17 and, between 18 and 25, you are, that's, classified as normal weight. 25 to 30 is overweight. You are overweight between, I'm one of them. My BMI is 27, about 26, 27. And then from 30 to 40 is obese. And over 40, we call it morbidly obese, morbidly. Okay, so you can easily know, you can calculate this by yourself, or there is an app that can tell you your BMI. Okay, so if your BMI is 26, 25 to 30, maybe that's, I'm sure, I'm sure you are in that category. I'm very sure. So <laughs> in that case, you are just overweight. You are not obese. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. Okay, there is a question that, we, that I have on YouTube. And okay. uh, somebody is asking, is it advisable to do hormone replacement? Oh, very good question. Thank you. I don't know who asked that question. <laughs> you know, <laughs> personally, you know, I, as a physician, I don't like it. I don't support it. And I'm retired now, so I will never uh, be able to practice it. Because, yeah, hormone replacement, you're talking about women, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it can help to replace some of the things that estrogen uh, gives to women. Remember, we talked about the dryness of the vag vaginal mucosa making sex difficult. Yes, it can alleviate that problem. It can, uh, I mean, help to mitigate the uh, consequences of menopause. But the side effects are not very good. Uh, cancer, breast cancer is one. Uh, deep venous thrombosis is another one. So this risk, are, in my opinion, too heavy, too much to, uh, to, to be able to justify the use. But some doctors use, use them. Uh, I have never been in the situation where I was faced with the choice because my practice didn't involve that. I wasn't a gynecologist or plastic doctor or whatever, plastic surgeon. Um, but in that's my own view. That's my. I I don't think it's a good thing. But again, that is the view of this person speaking to you. Some other doctors will say yes. Let's go ahead and and do it. It, it has its own risks. All right. Thank you yes. very much, sir. You're welcome. Uh, there's another question uh, from YouTube. Uh, why do black men black men uh, why do they go? Uh, why do they bend over, and can it be avoided? Like when they start aging, and then they are they stoop over or something like that, or they are bent over as they start to age. Black men. I mean, this is what the person said. Why do I don't, all black men? I don't think it's restricted to black men only. Okay. You know, we you know we live in the United States. We see. Yeah, they stoop. Stooping is a consequence of aging for men and women, black or Caucasian or Asian or Indian. Uh, yeah. It's big, and you remember w w the the bones start to undergo some changes. You have reduction in the height of the vertebra, so you you go shorter. You become shorter than your if your height when you are remember that bell curve, the bell curve that I drew. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the top of that bell curve, that's where you have your maximum height. Maybe you are five feet 10. When you get to almost the bottom, 
you probably be five eight because you're you're going to have a reduction. People get shorter, no doubt about that. And then they can stoop. The stooping is due to curvature of the spine of the spine, especially the thoracic spine. The one the spine uh, surrounding the chest, the the spine sorry supporting the chest. So when that one curves due to uh, differential. Uh, uh, loss of height of the vertebra, then the, the stooping starts occurring. So it's my answer is it's not only blacks, it's everybody. Okay. But maybe you have noticed more of uh, black it, men. It, it, was yeah. a question, it was a question sent by somebody. Um, I know, I know. Okay. There's yeah. another question. I know during the presentation, you, you talked about sex changes in women. Uh, yes. vaginal dryness and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, how 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 does this affect men? Are there changes in men too as they grow older? <laughs> the, you know, the in terms of sexual activity in men, a man can father a child even at the age of ninety years. The 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 provided he has an erection. Okay. Uh, and yeah, so erectile dysfunction may occur, but I mentioned that also, but if there is no erectile dysfunction, the production of sperm and semen is not affected. It may decrease a little bit, but the ability to father children is not affected. And we've seen men in their 80s, late 80s and 90s, becoming fathers. Uh, the social responsibility is another thing entirely, whether it's proper for a man to do that. So, but the only major problem that affects men in terms of aging is, is about this prostate thing. And that's a major, major problem. It's a terrible thing to have. <laughs> but in terms of sexual ability, uh, I don't think so. It's not the same. As in men, the, the level of testosterone could drop, but it's not as drastic as the level of estrogen in women. Estrogen level in women drops precipitously. It drops a lot. And that's why they go into menopause. But the level of testosterone in men does not drop as significantly as the level of estrogen drops in women. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Any other You're question? Welcome. Any other question? Right. I think we are done with this session. I just want to um, thank you one more time, Dr. Odumosu. We appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Thank you for all of the insights. Thank you for answering all of our questions. And uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and um, one of the things that I want to leave with our members, especially mountaineers that are on this on this uh, Zoom and YouTube uh, um, video, is that this is the first in a series of lectures that we want to be providing at Ixosana, and uh, we've termed it "Well, Wealthy Mind, Healthy Body," and it's a lecture series. I think our next one is going to be very, it's going to be tied closely to this. That is when we start to talk about things that you can start preparing in terms of uh, financial preparation as, as, you, as you start to age. And uh, we're talking about um, well, life insurance, group life insurance, the cost of aging. And, the, and that question was appropriately asked by Mr. Kamilu Ali, who is an expert in the field, is going to be taking our next, our next uh, Well the Mind, Elder Body lecture that we're going to have. We're going to be uh, sending out information about the next one. It's going to happen in November. We'll send the date out to everybody. Uh, once again, I just want to thank you all for coming and uh, for sharing in this experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Please ensure that it doesn't clash with the Yoruba Book Club uh, date and time, okay? Because okay, a lot of people 
said in the Yoruba Book Club that they would have loved to listen to that, but they don't want to miss Pagunwa or something. So okay. just put that in mind. Okay. And also, I just want to remind everybody that this is a recorded session. It will be permanently on YouTube, on our Ixosana channel on YouTube. And so okay. if you have missed any part of this, you can always go back to refer to the recording. It will be there. Thank you very much, Mr. Bakari. We will keep that at the back of our minds the next time. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. You're Thank you. I'm back. See you, see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Bye, bye. Bye.